Kristen Smart went out with some friends on May 24, 1996, hoping to find a Friday night party to kick off the long Memorial Day weekend. But first, the 19-year-old called her parents, letting them know in the message she left on their answering machine that she had good news and would phone again on Sunday. She was very excited, her mom, Denise Smart, told the Los Angeles Times in 2006, recalling how Kristen shared that her biology professor was letting her retake an exam that had inexplicably gone missing earlier that quarter. She said, hi, good news, good news. That was her good news, she had gotten a call from professor whatever his name was. She had been trying for so long to get that resolved. Denise figured they'd catch up on Sunday, as they always had during Kristen's freshman year at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. Kristen, the eldest of three siblings, who wrote poetry and had worked as a lifeguard in her hometown of Stockton, did find a party. M on May 24, Kristen and three girlfriends left campus on foot and soon caught a ride in another pal's truck. After driving around for a couple of hours, Kristen suggested they go to a birthday party being thrown by some fraternity brothers at a nearby house. Someone who wasn't as independent as Kristen wouldn't have gone to a party alone. She kept saying, you go with me. But I didn't want to go. I told her, you better be careful, and she said she would be fine. Then she said bye. At that point in the evening, according to Kristen's friends, none of them, including Kristen, had been drinking. Witnesses later told authorities that Kristen seemed intoxicated when she left the party, with one person claiming they saw her drinking tequila, while police were also told she was chugging vodka. When going through her emails, investigators also learned that she sometimes tried on different names for size, finding messages signed with a variety of monikers, including Roxy and Trixie. She picked Roxy for this particular night out. Kristen's parents described her as a warm, kind, fun-loving and adventurous but sometimes anxious girl, one who worked as a camp counselor on Oahu and traveled to Venezuela on an exchange program but was scared to get her driver's license. She called her mom every week and wasn't loving college so far but was trying. Investigators found that she ended her email messages with live your life to be an exclamation rather than an explanation. She had dyed her naturally blonde hair brown during the school year and, the mercury hovering at 80 degrees on the night of May 24, friends remembered her casually dressed in black running shorts with the crop t-shirt and red sneakers. During the party, Kristen, who had told some people that her name was Roxy, was seen at one point with Paul Flores, also a 19-year-old freshman. The trio got to Cheryl's building first, Cheryl told investigators, recalling that Paul said he'd be sure to get Kristen back to her room safely. They went back and forth a little, Cheryl said, explaining that she would have walked Kristen back herself if Paul hadn't insisted he'd do it. She said that she didn't remember Kristen saying anything on the walk home.
Maybe she shook his hand, she recalled. Then he and Kristen walked off into the night. Paul told campus police that, as they approached their respective residence halls, he and Kristen went their separate ways. He had a black eye, he explained, from playing pickup basketball the Monday after the party. A police report stated that Paul's roommate, who had been away for the weekend, said Paul told him of the night in question that he walked Kristen to her dorm and went back to his room. But also he had teased Paul about the case, the roommate added, and when he asked Paul what he did with Kristen, Paul said, she's home with my parents. Paul appeared before a grand jury in October 1996, one of eight people subpoenaed to give evidence. He invoked his Fifth Amendment right to not incriminate himself, and his testimony only lasted for about five minutes. Meanwhile, some friends had gone looking for Kristen later that weekend, when she failed to turn up, and knocks on her door went unanswered. She called the university police department twice, and later that day they reached out to Kristen's parents to see if she was at home with them. When they first contacted us, like any parent, I was frustrated to think that she'd done something embarrassing, Dad Stan told the San Francisco Examiner in 1998. Per the La Times, in the university police's May 28 report first documenting that Kristen was missing, an officer wrote, Smart appeared to be under the influence of alcohol on Friday night. Smart lives her life in her own way, not conforming to typical teenage behavior. The last sentence of the report read, These observations are in no way implying that her behavior caused her disappearance, but they provide a picture of her conduct on the night of her disappearance. Frustrations pile up in the investigation into Kristen Smart's disappearance Margarita Campos said on the November. And here's your key, Margarita said. I knocked on her door, and I thought she was just sleeping, or she went out and about, you know. As for the campus police, she recalled, they were, like, are you sure she didn't go out of town? It's, like, she has nothing on her. How could she have gone out of town? To this day, like, I was like, why, why did I just let her go by herself? Talking to the Los Angeles Times in 2006, Denise recalled feeling as if investigators were treating Kristen like a lost bicycle. Searchers conducted a dig at the landfill, where the Cal Poly trash was dumped several days after Kristen disappeared, but it was reportedly four weeks before campus police reached out, out to the San Luis Obispo Sheriff's Department for assistance. Why did police suspect Paul Flores of being involved in Kristen Smart's disappearance? Soon, however, investigators honed in on Paul, a below-average student who, according to what his parents told police, had no friends in high school and hadn't found much social success in college either. In December 1995, another female student had called the San Luis Obispo police on him after he climbed up a trellis and refused to get off her balcony, but he left before officers arrived.
Tim also said, per the source, that he saw Roxy at the end of the night lying down outside on the next door neighbor's lawn. He went over to wake her up and she told him she was cold. Authorities thoroughly believed that Paul was their guy, that he was the only one who could say for sure what happened to Kristen. Four different scent dogs led police to Paul's dorm, an indicator that she had been there. In a 1997 deposition, Paul invoked his Fifth Amendment right not to incriminate himself in response to every question other than what is your name? The Smarts also kept their own files on the case and kept tabs on Paul, sending members of his family photos of Kristen in their myriad pleas to get them to talk. All of the packages were returned after being opened to the Smarts. Denise and Stan kept the search for Kristen going after police activity tapered off, giving interviews in order to keep her name and face in the news, contacting the FBI and state lawmakers. It's been like having an open wound and having someone continually pouring salt in it, Denise told the examiner in 1998. Having a missing child is just not something that gets better over time. It's another dimension, and it just can't heal. A lawyer who had previously represented Paul told the newspaper that there were no facts to indicate that Paul had anything to do with the disappearance of Kristen Smart. We only want our daughter back. Two years after his daughter went missing, Stan Smart was still going to Cal Poly about once a month to search for Kristen or traces of her himself. Stan feels like sometimes he just needs to go there to be there, Denise explained. But even when the initial frenzy quieted down, the investigation was frequently revisited over the years. Amateur sleuths took up the case as well, chat rooms and message boards giving way to social media and Reddit threads. The most notable deep dive of late came courtesy of musician Chris Lambert's 2019-2020 podcast Your Own Backyard, seemingly a nod both to the proximity of the crime to where he grew up an authority's suspicion that Paul had buried Kristen close to home. The result, however, was always the same frustrating dead end that Kristen's killer was out there, and it was no secret as to whom the police suspected, but there were no arrests and no charges. This has been a frustrating case for us, for the parents, for the press, because we don't have an answer to what happened here. I mean, I still have a lot of anger about this situation. And my wife is a bit of an emotional wreck at times. And it hasn't been resolved. We haven't really resolved the issues as to where our daughter is and what happened to her.
four other residences in California and Washington were searched last year, as well, including Paul's mother Susan's residence in Arroyo Grande, Calif. And on April 13, 2021, seven weeks shy of the 25th anniversary of Kristen's disappearance, Paul, now 45, was arrested and the next day charged with first-degree murder, authorities alleging that on the morning of May 25, 1996, he tried to sexually assault Kristen in his dorm room and, in the course of events, killed her and then buried her body in his father's yard. He has pleaded not guilty. At arraignment his lawyer, Robert Sanger, said Paul denies every allegation, special or otherwise, against him. Paul's 80-year-old father, Ruben Flores, was also arrested at his home in Arroyo Grande and charged with accessory after the fact of murder for allegedly helping Paul hide Kristen's body. He pleaded not guilty and was released on $50,000 bail into his ex-wife's supervision and fitted with an ankle bracelet monitor. Rubin's attorney, Harold Messick, countered that the so-called evidence against his client, disrupted soil, was so minimal as to shock the conscience. Paul, who moved to Southern California in the late 1990s and was arrested in San Pedro, was denied bail and has been in custody since his arrest. Hess currently in a Monterey County jail about 126 miles away from San Luis Obispo, a judge having ordered a change of venue for the trial. It is believed she is deceased, but there is no evidence of what happened to her after Paul Flores left her. At a press conference announcing the arrests in April 2021, San Luis Obispo County Sheriff Ian Parkinson, Wad held the top job since 2011, acknowledged that, in the days immediately following Kristen's disappearance, mistakes were made and that made things much more difficult. The task he and his team accepted was unprecedented in volume and scope, yet they met every setback and challenge with resolve and an unequaled commitment to Kristen and our family. The smart longtime attorney James Murphy, who filed the wrongful death suit on their behalf in 1996 and has had a billboard touting of $75,000 reward for information leading to Kristen's whereabouts in his front yard since 1997, told 48 hours after the floor as arrests, to see them in custody was a feeling of great joy for me. He promised them the billboard would stay up until that happened 